All right, a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening and a warm welcome to one and all for the third edition of the Winning View series, a Movate series to elevate and advance gender parity in technology and celebrate the women forging innovation. Women are forging change worldwide via technology and sustainability in their communities, workplace and beyond. With all the amazing innovations we have seen in technology, it can be sometimes very easy to forget how much tech is influenced by human nature. The machine values actually come from the human values. And we've all been so inspired by the stories shared by women from all ages, ethnicities and backgrounds on the advancements in technology that they have made. And we have amongst us today one such woman leader who has been surging forward in her career successfully. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Alison Close, Research Manager, Intelligent Finance and Customer Care Business Process Services. Ali is a Research Manager for IDC's Worldwide Outsourcing Services team and leads the Worldwide Intelligent Finance and Customer Care Business Process Service practice. This includes coverage of finance and accounting, customer care, contact center, procurement and logistics business process outsourcing services. In addition, she covers analytics services for long-term, discrete or bundled outsource engagements. As part of developing research for this program, her focus is on research related to IDC's third platform, particularly in the areas of intelligent automation, platforms and business process as a service. Prior to joining IDC, she spent the majority of her time working at global digital marketing agencies and market research firms developing and leading the analysis of disparate data sources to guide brand and marketing strategies and recommend the next best actions to senior leadership, cross-functional teams and external clients. A very warm welcome, Ali. And uh, may I now invite you to share some opening remarks before we start off with questions and start interviewing you. Sure, yeah, thank you so much, first of all, for having me. So happy to be here today and be talking about this kind of exciting topic. Um, yeah, so I'm looking for, I've been at, to give you a little bit of background, I've been at IDC for about seven years. Um, have always been working in the research, market research kind of analytics um, market since school, uh, since I graduated school. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to talk about whatever you guys want to ask me today. So I'm really looking forward to it. Cool. So, so let me start off, um, and when you began your career uh, many, many years ago, or not so many years ago, what was guided your <laughs> what guided your path to become uh, becoming a leading industry analyst? And did you kind of experiment on the way, or were you always sure what you wanted to be and where you wanted to be? So, I would say I always knew I wanted to work in market research. So that's kind of what I studied in undergrad and in grad school. Um, it was kind of a focus more on the data analysis part, um, kind of more more focused on quantitative research. Um, so I kind of always knew I wanted to do that. Um, but throughout my career, I kind of started at a market research firm doing more like data analysis and um, statistical analysis. Um, and then I kind of moved to um, kind of like the digital agency world. So I worked at two different digital agencies. And again, I was doing research, but it was more for like CPG firms, um, you know, healthcare firms. It was kind of across industries. And when I applied to IDC to be an industry analyst, I felt like that was a little bit of a switch from what I was doing. So I feel like the skills were transferable, but I was literally going from doing research for, like I said, like maybe a CPG firm to technology. So I feel like there was a little bit of a, um, a gap there where I had to become smart about kind of the BPO, CX world pretty quickly. Um, so I hope that I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. So so, also, so since the uh, side of this side of the audience is all from the BPO or from the uh, technology industry, now we have seen this side of it. Now, uh, what inspired you to kind of become uh, an industry analyst, and what guided you to to take this path? Yeah. Um, to be honest, when I applied for the job, I was like, are they gonna like? I felt like maybe I didn't have all the skills that I needed. Um, but I was like, I'm just going to try it. We'll see what happens. Um, and the thing that drew me to being an analyst was the ability to kind of write about and cover what I thought were the hottest trends. There's really no right or, thing, right or wrong thing that I could be writing about. I kind of had my own ability to pick and choose what I want to write about. Um, so I really liked that kind of freedom. Um, and again, being able to write kind of thought leadership pieces and putting my own spin on what I thought, you know, was happening in the industry. So I kind of liked that, that element of freedom. Right, right. And I think that's that's been your guiding spirit then. 
Awesome, awesome. So um, now in your career that spanned uh, so many years, uh, what has been the most significant barrier uh, that you think kind of put a hold or probably could have uh, hampered your growth and how did you overcome that? Sure. I think the number one thing for me was my confidence, actually. So I remember when I first started off, I was like, I never felt like I wanted to be too assertive in a meeting because I felt like that might come off as, you know, I don't know, like like I said, being too assertive or being too aggressive, maybe. And then I also thought maybe if I'm not speaking up in a meeting or I'm being a little bit quiet, then that comes off as me being like weak. So I think for me, it was building that confidence to be like, you know, you have something to say, just say it. It's okay if it's right or wrong, or if it ruffles some feathers, like it's going to be okay. So I think building my confidence over time um, was the one kind of barrier for me, I would say. And then I guess secondly, the other thing too, like I mentioned, like I came from a world before IDC where I was doing research in very different industries. So going from those industries to tech was a little bit of a jump for me. So having to learn and get up to speed very quickly about the BPO world, I felt like that was not maybe not so much a barrier, but like a challenge. Right. So that is more of a intrinsic, but did you kind of face any barriers uh, from an environment from, from the people that you work with, any sort of unconscious bias or anything like that? Have you faced anything like that, uh, Abby? Yeah, um, I can't say I totally have. I think there's a couple, you know, a couple of things here and there that have happened where, you know, maybe I felt overlooked in meetings because it was more dominated by older male colleagues, um, I think, but I feel like that is something that kind of is always kind of happening. It's not a new thing. Um, So a little bit of that maybe, but beyond that, I can't say I've experienced anything kind of more more drastic than that. Right, right. Yeah. Lovely. So who inspired you as a leader and and what was special and why? Why did they inspire you? Yeah. So I worked at a digital marketing and event agency called Kramer, located right outside of Boston. I had a boss there who at the time was like a mom of like young, like five year olds. So she was maybe, I don't know, like late 30s ish. And I was probably early 20s. And she inspired me because I felt like she did it all. She, you know, she would always say she was at the gym in the morning. You know, she gets the kids up to school. She looked the part, right? Like always well-dressed, always like presented herself in a certain way and was like so good at her job. And I just remember being like, I want to do all those things. Like I want to be all those things too. I want to do it all. Um, And she was a great boss. Um, And I feel like she was a great boss because she really mentored me. She took me under her wing. She showed me what to do and how to do it. Um, and she pushed me too. She pushed me kind of a little bit out of my comfort zone to, you know, again, like be a little bit more assertive or have that confidence or kind of say, say what you feel. So I think she's kind of helped you to become a, a more assertive person, uh, yeah. the person that you are today. Right. Yep. Right. Awesome. So, so what would you describe as your leadership style, Ali? And uh, do you need to kind of um, adapt to your leadership style? You think that uh, in the corporate world, what you are as an individual, it, does it come kind of flows naturally or do you have to adapt yourself a little differently for the corporate world? Um, you know, I, I haven't changed myself. I feel like the way I am, you know, at home and doing non-work things is how I am as a leader and how I present myself at work too. And I, I try to keep that the same. There's no reason for it to be different. I don't feel like in the workplace you need to be, you know, more buttoned up or some other version of yourself. Um, so I think I would describe my leadership style as very kind of c- collaborative. I, I want to make sure that I'm kind of mentoring and um, helping and teaching people what they need to know so they can be successful. Um, I think that's like huge. I think. And, and I learned this from my boss. He always says that his job um, in terms of, you know, mentoring me is to take stuff off my plate, take the, the kind of manual, like, I don't know, kind of manual admin stuff off, off his plate. So that's what I try to do too, like take stuff off their plate, make their jobs easier, um, give them what they need to be successful. So um, I think maybe those, those two I things. Think it's, it's, it's yeah. more informal, it's more empowering uh, yeah. kind of a leadership. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. absolutely. So, right. So you've been um, observing the customer experience industry for a while. And in your experience, um, what do you think are the top three qualities for a CX leader? And does it change? Uh, does leadership styles change to different industries? What do you think? What are your views? Yeah, so 
Qualities for a good CX leader, um, I think you have to be able to kind of take risks, even if it's uncomfortable maybe. And I guess my kind of thought behind that is just like, you just gotta do stuff sometimes, like just do it. If it doesn't work out, it's okay. If it's maybe not the right thing at the right time and you figure that out, it's okay. So just take risks, I think, is a good a good quality of a, or a quality of a good leader. Um, I think being like analytical, right? We always talk about using more data and having access to more data, using data, right, to, to make decisions. Um, and I think also, and I think maybe this applies to me a little bit, being empathetic. Um, I think when you're an empathetic leader, um, you get the best out of other people. Kind of, you know, that, that personality and warmth, I think it, it helps in developing good relationships. So I think maybe those two or, two or three things. Awesome. I think empathy is, is key to any leader for that matter, but uh, not just a leader, even as a human being, empathy is yes. very, very critical and it really goes a long way when you're a leader. Absolutely. Very true. Very true. So um, how do you think this whole uh, customer experience or the BPO industry has changed for women um, you know, from when we started uh, to, to now? Uh, there is a lot of changes that the industry has gone through, but for women in specific, how do you think uh, the industry has changed? Has it been more welcoming? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's definitely more welcoming. I still think it's kind of like a slow progression, but I definitely have seen more women, definitely in the CX BPO space than maybe like finance and accounting or procurement. There's definitely more women kind of moving into those leadership roles, I would say. Um, right. And I think also kind of even outside of like um, customer care, kind of BPO, when you look at like IT, obviously there's, there's more women moving into IT and tech, which obviously kind of correlates to, you know, CXBPO a little bit, but um, like there's tons of those programs like Girls Who Code that are becoming really big. So I think definitely more more IT skills too um, are playing a role, and you know we see more women moving in that role um, as well. True. Yeah, true, true, great. And um, if you could uh, share a few uh, gender uh, inclusive policies or practices in your organizations, and also tell us uh, what can leaders do to make their organizations truly uh, gender inclusive. Sure. Um, so something we do at IDC is a lot of internal training on um, some of those gender inclusive categories or understanding unconscious bias. Um, we did some training on that, which was really eye opening and very helpful. Um, so we do a lot of training, which is like kind of watching these on online modules, taking little quizzes. Um, right. So we do a lot of that. Um, I think for organizations to become more gender inclusive, for me at least, I feel like it has to start um, with the top leaders in the C-suite. Um, I feel like th th that set of people have to be kind of diverse when it comes to gender, race, generations, instead of it being kind of dominated by, you know, boomer men, <laughs> for example. Um, so, yeah. So the, I feel like the training that we do definitely is helpful. It makes you think about things that um, maybe you weren't thinking about before or you know, um, maybe you were being, you, you were having unconscious bias and didn't even know it. So that's type of training makes you think about this stuff. So it's been very helpful. Absolutely. I think uh, the biggest uh, peril in the industry is the whole unconscious bias. We don't know what we're doing and we end up right. uh, being very biased towards yep. the particular community or towards gender or a race. So Absolutely. very, very important. True. So uh, a very different, uh, if not a CX expert, what else would you have been today? That's a good question. This is like totally polar opposite about, about what I do now, but I think I would have been a nurse um, because I like to be on my feet and the thought of being able to work longer, you know, longer shifts for a few amount of days to spend more time with my kids is a, a little bit appealing. So maybe that or honestly analyst relations, because I feel like as an analyst to spin from being an analyst to work in analyst relations, it's kind of this natural progression because you're looking at things from the other side. Um, right. So sometimes you think, I'm like, oh, maybe I would be good at that. <laughs> so I think those those are the two two jobs for me, I guess, besides. Yeah. 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 Analyst relations is something I can understand. Nurse is just going off the roof for me. Uh, right. Very, very radical kind of a choice that you had. And very interesting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so what would be uh, one tip that you'd want to share uh, for our women leaders who are here with us on the call? And of course, yep. for all of our uh, men allies who have joined us as well on the call today. Sure. Um, I think, and this is totally speaking on, based on my experience, but like believe in yourself, right? And don't second guess yourself. I, said, I think sometimes that's something I do too. 
like I maybe said something or wrote something and I'll second guess it. Like, just don't like, just put it out there, say what you think, believe in yourself and it's like gonna be okay, right? <laughs> if it comes off a certain way and maybe did or didn't with a certain tone or whatever it is, like, just don't think about it. Just say what you feel, don't second guess yourself and just, just have confidence. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alice. So these are some of the questions that I had and I, 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 and I could continue talking to you, but I thought we should also open up uh, the forum for uh, the audience that has joined us today. And uh, maybe we we'll, uh, take some questions from them and then I can come back always. Uh, so uh, anybody from the uh, audience participants who joined us for the meeting, if there are any questions that you'd like to ask or anything that you'd like to share with Ali, and this can be very informal, this can be, uh, you know, it need not be very specific to only uh, uh, specific topics that you have in mind. Let's just have a very open uh, conversation out here. So anybody who want to take a few questions or ask a few questions to Ali. They can put it on the chat or they can unmute themselves yeah. and ask. Well, I just wanted to share that I really like the appreciation that the, that the made. Since this is the first time they're working on a BPO on how everything was working, I definitely felt identified when uh, in my beginning. So I just wanted to to let you know that I definitely feel you. <laughs> just that. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. I, I have a question, Ali, I, sure. and uh, it's a little bit of a tricky question, actually. <laughs> so, uh, uh, like from women leaders, sometimes uh, I hear like some opposing views, like some uh, women leaders are, um, so when we speak of challenges, uh, uh, the view is that everybody faces challenges and let's, you know, put in the work, uh, overcome our challenges and then let's, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, make our mark and, you know, that's the way to progress. And uh, uh, versus an approach where, you know, we are more vocal about the challenges which are only specific to women and, you know, creating that. So how, like, what do you think, what's your style or like, should there be a balance? Any comment on that? So are you saying like, you've kind of heard that the challenges are same across genders and we should all just kind of work? Uh, no, work they're not the same, but uh, everybody has challenges. So women have some challenges, but then maybe men from certain other background might have some other challenges. So everybody overcomes some kinds of challenges and uh, we should, uh, rather than maybe complaining and being vocal about it, let's put in the work and, you know, make our mark. Uh, versus, uh, so like, uh, uh, we speak about women's challenges, so something can be done systematic, uh, you know, systemically about them. Uh, so uh, what what's your style on that or what's your comment yeah. on that? Yeah, so I think it's a balance, right? So yes, obviously we have to put in the work, um, but I do still feel like it is, our, our challenges are greater, right? Cause we are outnumbered. We're still outnumbered. Yeah. Um, and so for us to push forward, um, it's, it's still, I feel like more work for us than hmm. maybe our male, male counterparts. Um, but like you said, yes, challenges are going to be different across different races as well, or, um, generations. Yeah. Um, so I, I do think it's a balance, but I do feel like we still have to push harder. And I think there's definitely a greater bias among women because we're supposed to do it all, right? Like mm -hmm. if we're not, if we're a stay at home mom, we're not motivated, not motivated, right? We don't work, we're not motivated. Mm -hmm. um, if we're a working mom, then we're not spending as much time with our kids. If we're too assertive in a, in a meeting, that looks a certain way. If we're not, if we're kind of quiet in a meeting, that looks a certain way. So we have all these things that we're dealing with that I think some of our male colleagues, counterparts aren't maybe dealing with as much. So I do think it's a kind of a greater barrier for us still. Um, so we have to balance it, balance it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Alison, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, how can women support other women in their organizations? Um, yeah, I think we need to mentor each other, like l lean on each other for advice, you know, collaboration, learning, whatever it is. I think we need to mentor each other. Um, something we do at IDC, we actually have a mentor program so that I'm a part of. So I get paired up with, um, you know, some entry level employees and kind of 
meet with them a couple times a quarter, show them what to do and how to do it, and I'm there for kind of any questions. So I think mentoring is great. Um, and I think giving each other recognition, that's something else that we do at IDC. We have um, an internal platform where, you know, it's it's kind of like a, almost like an internal Facebook for employees where I can say, hey, so-and-so, it was great working with you. Appreciate the work you did. Thanks so much. And it's actually, you get points for doing this. Um, so I just think mentoring, recognition, supporting each other, um, all that good stuff. Well, thanks, Alison. Absolutely. So I have a question that somebody's asked me in the chat. Uh, says you were talking about risk, which seems to be your positive approach. Uh, but was there any moment where you reviewed the data, presented it, but you completely felt that they did not match, uh, and you kind of decided to take it a risk and go against the numbers, and uh, it ended up as the best result, best decision that you've ever taken. Uh, so anything like that, any kind of instance that has happened in your life? Yeah, so absolutely. So there's definitely been times where I presented data and it says one thing and I'll present it that way, but then I will give my flavor too. But like, yes, the data is saying this, but I think this. Um, so yeah, I definitely kind of, if that happens, I try to insert my opinion if it's a little bit different than what the data is saying. Um, and it's never, I, I don't think it's ever backfired because you're kind of sharing, you're sharing a different view, right? Like, yes, the data says one thing, but it could also be this. So yeah, I haven't had an instance where it's totally backfired yet. <laughs> Hopefully it never does. <laughs> so just, just follow up on that uh, question, Ali. Uh, have you ever had to kind of push for a change or a system of change, especially when it's an unpopular idea or a new idea? And how do you do that? Um, I'm trying to think if I've ever had, um, I can't really think of a, t let me, let me think, um, sorry. <laughs> um, I guess there's been a couple times where, um, and this was more around kind of business developing, business development and, um, me trying to get new clients to my program. Um, and I went to my boss with a challenge that I was having. Um, and this is more kind of work related than any kind of, you know, um, systematic gender, you know, kind of focused area, but it was more work related. But I went to him and I was like, I'm having this challenge. Can you help me? And he was like, yes, like these are the, the things you need to do to get prepared. We'll review what you put together and then we'll go to his boss and you can present it. Um, so, so, I mean, some, there's been a couple instances like that in different areas, but again, it's kind of more work focused specific to you know, my research or business development. Um, but I luckily have a very good boss who is very supportive of when I go to him with ideas. He's like, yes, we can make this happen. Um, you need to do these things and right. we'll go from there. Thank you, thank you. Got somebody unmuted. So I'm, I'm gonna ask you uh, something else, Ali. Uh, and this is, uh, which is very, personally very close to me as well. And we always talk about work-life balance, right? And when we talk about that, uh, there are only two things that people talk about. One is your career and one is your personal life. And personal life is always around uh, family, children, and, and all of that, right? But um, as women, uh, there are also some passions that we'd like to pursue apart from work and apart from family. So uh, is there such a thing called balance, really? Uh, can we do it all? And and there are, I, I do know some women who have who had uh, illustrious careers of taking care of their families and have had time to pursue their own passions in life. So uh, is that something really possible? And if yes, um, how can we balance this out? Uh, and there's no demarcation separately, right? And you really can't say I would spend eight hours on work, I would spend three hours on my family and I'll do two hours something for myself. And you really can't do that in today's context, in today's world. So right. how do you do it then? So how do you yeah. kind of balance it out, prioritize? Yeah. So yeah, like you said, so like the career and personal life thing is like all mushed together every day, right? Like obviously you're working and then you're driving the kids to sports and you're doing homework and you're cooking dinner. Like that's all like meshed together, right? And then beyond that, it's like, how do you find time to do stuff for you? And I personally, so I play soccer. So every Tuesday night, I am playing soccer between the hours of like eight and 10. Like that is my thing, wow. I'm signed up and I go. Um, and my husband knows, and if my husband, he works um, funny hours for his job, so if he can't watch the kids, my parents will come over and watch the kids. Like, that is my thing. Someone is helping me watch the kids at night, right? So I do that. Um, I I run the, the soccer league, the youth soccer league in my town too, I'm the president. Um, so that's like, we probably, our board meets maybe once a month. Um, 
So I, I do that too. My, you know, I have dedicated my one hour a month where I meet with, with the board to do that. Um, and again, my family supports me and makes it happen. Somebody, either my husband's watching the kids or my parents are babysitting. Um, so I do make time for myself um, with those things. And then also just like getting to the gym and doing some type of physical activity. Before every week, I have to pick my days where I think I can squeeze in like an hour to work out. Like maybe it's not Tuesdays because my kids have their sports and homework and whatever it is. So I will literally at the beginning of the week, I'm like, okay, I think I can only go Saturday and Tuesday and I have to make it happen those days. Um, so I think just being, I don't know, like diligent about whatever it is we're going to do, like find the time and plan it out and, and do it. So, and I do think it, we can balance it all because we're already doing it. Everyone's already doing right. it. <laughs> yeah. Right. So you're not just a soccer mom who goes to the kids' soccer games, but you also play soccer. That's that's really nice, Ali. Uh, so, uh, in fact, um, I think that's that's something that I also wanted to know because um, it's not very easy, right, to kind of uh, uh, calendarize, prioritize your uh, passions. And it's amazing that you're able to do that. You plan this a uh, week, uh, the start of the week, saying, okay, this is how these are the days that I can do. These are the days that I can uh, do. Uh, now, um, a lot of uh, women that I've worked with and keep asking me this right say uh, see it's, it's easier to convince the spouse but the children don't understand because they are their kids they are young they expect the moms to be there uh, when they are sick they want the moms to be there at school for the PTAs for everything right so how did you manage that did you actually sit through, sit down with your children speak to them about uh, your priorities speak to them about your passion speak to them all of this or, or is it that they just understand how did you do that yeah, I explained it to them because my older son is funny. When I go to play soccer, he's like, where are you going? He's like, when are you going to be gone? And I'm like, I will only be gone for an hour in like 15 minutes max. Um, and I always, I, yeah, so I explained to him, I'm like, you know, I'm going to be gone for a little bit. Mommy wants to play some soccer. You know, when I come home, if you're still awake, I'll, you know, come say hello. If you're sleeping, I'll tuck you in. Um, so I just reassure him that it's, and it's really only my older son, which is funny. Uh, but yeah, I explained to him, I'm like, I need to, I need to do stuff for me too, you know, like you get to play your sports and hang with your friends. Um, and mommy wants to do her things too. So that's how, that's how I kind of explain it to them. Thank you so much, Ali. I think that kind of helps a lot of young mothers who are here with us today. Uh, it's okay. very important to set the context and have the Absolutely. conversation with your children. Totally. So anybody else who would like to ask questions? Because like I said, I can keep going, but I'd, I'd really love for the rest of you to also ask him share your feedback, share your opinions, share your thoughts. Yeah, hi Ali, this is Saikat here. Good to see you again. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. Uh, I have one question. So, what advice would you give to yourself if you could go back 15 years in time? Um, that's a great question. Um, I would say Again, it kind of goes back to the confidence thing for me. Like, don't second guess myself and be confident in what you're doing. Um, and maybe ask for more help or guidance. Because I think sometimes I remember being younger and be like, oh, I can just do this. I don't need to ask for help. I can just figure it out yeah. and do it. Like, it's okay to ask for help. And it still is now. And I, that's something I explain to my kids too when they're doing their homework and they don't understand. I'm like, just ask, ask your teacher. That's what she's there for. I'm like, I ask questions every day still to my boss. So. Yeah, be confident, be bold, and you know, don't be afraid to ask for help. Great, I think that's a very great advice. I also keep asking myself that I probably push myself to ask more questions every now and then. Yep. So, great. Yep. Thanks. You're welcome. Hi, Punita, it's Arvind. Ali, hi. Hi. Uh, you know, it's a great conversation. Ali, I have a simple question. I mean, your energy is infectious. Okay. You are so energetic. What is is there a secret drink you have for your morning? I have had two cups of coffee. <laughs> I have had two cups of coffee. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> okay. I actually, well, in, in not honesty, I was excited to have this conversation. Um, just because it's um, a little off the cuff, you know, it's it's something I I love talking about too. Um, so I'm, I was so happy when you guys asked me, and I was I'm honestly because I was excited to talk about it. So, no terrific. I picked up many things to learn from you. Thank you so much. Sure. All right. So until somebody else thinks of the questions to ask you, uh, let me ask you this: uh, What or who is your biggest source of motivation? I mean, 
uh, Arvind said you're very energetic. So we'd like to know who is that, apart from the two cups of coffee that you've had, but who is that uh, motivation? What is that source of your motivation? Yeah, I would say definitely my kids, because I want to show them that obviously they can do whatever they want. You can do it all. Um, and I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful that the way I do things and the stuff I'm doing, like they look to it and like, oh, yes, I want to do those things too. Or I can do it if my mom does it. Um, so definitely my kids and definitely my dad. He is my like sounding board. Um, when I have questions about, you know, work stuff, life stuff, I always go to him. I feel like he just always has the right answers. Like dads seem to know everything. Um, so he is my sounding board too. Um, so I would say, yeah, my kids and my dad, for sure. Anybody from the participants would like to ask Ali? Hi, this is Mo from the Philippines. I have a question for Ali. So, um, you know, we've talked about your leadership skills. I heard it was asked earlier, but what do you think are your leadership skills that you're still continuing to work on? That's a good question. Um, I think, you know, I consider myself to be like very empathetic and collaborative which is fine. I think sometimes though, at certain points, you do need to be a little bit more assertive or straightforward with feedback. And I think I could be better, I could better manage those kind of conversations where maybe you have to be a little bit more forceful or do you know what I mean? Assertive, I don't know if those are the right words, but um, I think I could be better at that. So maybe even, you know, being better at having difficult conversations where you have to be a little bit more blunt. Um, I think I could be better at that. I have a follow up question. So in, you know, in having difficult conversations, is there any different approach that you kind of maybe consciously or unconsciously do when you're talking to a group of say women versus what your approach is when you talk to a group of men because you know in the industry it's inevitable that you would be um, working with like group of men um, as a majority yeah. and so is there a different approach that you follow when when you know you come across situations like that um no i i feel like i'm pretty much kind of the same regardless of who i'm speaking to or at least try to be i feel like you, it shouldn't be different right you should just be who you are and um yeah so i i don't think i really alter you know either whatever it is demeanor or tone of voice or speaking out more or less um i think it's pretty much the same and I, I don't want to, you know, take a lot of airtime, but just one last question because the questions are like connected to each other, right? Sure. So um, you mentioned about, you know, just working on being assertive and um, maybe being more direct, uh, not being forceful, but just being assertive in conversations, most especially in difficult conversations. Sure. Um, have you ever felt some resistance or, you know, uh, maybe people that you talk to who misconstrue being assertive as uh, in a negative way or in a different way and how did you manage that yeah that has definitely happened um, and I will just kind of have a follow-up conversation with that person if they come to me they're like oh you maybe you know said something a certain way or your tone of voice was this or whatever maybe I always explain I'm like I didn't mean this I meant this or I will just always go back and explain it in a very calm kind of manner. So it's definitely happened before. And I was like, you know, I just explained myself. Um, I didn't mean to come off this way. This is what I was trying to con convey. Um, so just follow up with an explanation. And, you know, it's kind of buried after that. So, um, yeah, learn and, and move on. <laughs> Sadly. Yeah. And I feel like it's happened the other way, too, where I felt, um, and this happened with um, a female colleague of mine, I felt her tone of voice was maybe a little bit condescending or you know there was a little bit of a certain tone with it and I went to her and I was like I don't appreciate that and she explained to me that you know she didn't mean to come off a certain way you know so we have we have I'll have a conversation always have a conversation it makes you feel better um it helps you get beyond it and, and move on so right and and the reason I asked that question is because sometimes uh, like for me I get very passionate um when I talk to people 
uh, yeah. sometimes even with my own team sure. and sometimes it happens that you know they kind of misunderstand you know how passionate you come across yeah. so that's something i'm also working on myself so yeah, yeah really happy to hear from you um, as to how you do this yeah Yeah, I, I have some passionate colleagues like that as well. Um, some I know better than others, and I know when they're being super passionate, it's not it's not coming off as being overly aggressive. I just know that that's their passion. So I think like understanding people's personalities too helps a little bit with that. Um, so. Thank you. Sure. Hi, Ali. This is Swarajya. I have a question for you. Sure. Okay. Uh, how do you feel uh, different business sectors, uh, how they treat uh, uh, gender diversity? Do we have greater gender diversity in different business sectors uh, or uh, especially for women in leadership? And uh, why do you think that this is so? Yeah. Yeah, I definitely. I do think there are some differences across industries. I feel like if you look at like manufacturing and logistics and supply chains, in supply chain, those sectors are, you know, you definitely see fewer female leaders. And I think it's because it's still totally dominated by men. Um, and same with, like, I feel like women are more well represented in like healthcare services, kind of education, those sectors. But again, there's more women already working in those sectors. So it's more dominated by, um, you know, the female population anyways. Um, so I think it's kind of, you know, driven by the amount of women already working or not working in those industries, right? Um, so I think that that is kind of part of the problem. All right, thank you. Yeah. So there are a couple of questions on the chat. I'm going to read it out for you, Ali. Uh, from sure. a company perspective, how can we help to support and encourage women to keep growing in their companies? Yeah, you have to give them opportunities. Um, opportunities to I mean, it could be anything like present, you know, like we do lunch and learns these our um, presentations during lunch where you can present about anything you want. Give them opportunities to present and share a voice. Um, yeah, I think those things and I guess the training helps too, just the, the gender bias training and all that stuff. So people can think about how they're treating others. Um, Um, have you faced any situations where uh, male co-workers uh, look or talk down to you because you're a woman? And how have you handled that kind of situation if you did face it? Yeah. Um, yes, it's definitely happened. Um, God, how did I react? Um, I feel like I never react in the way that I think I'm gonna. I, in my mind, I'm always like, I want to speak up immediately and, you know, just, uh, you know, say something immediately and I don't and I'm very kind of... Um, P PG about it um, and then I go back later and I'm like oh I wish I had like stuck up for myself more or I was said this in a certain way um, so I feel like I'm I do I put my best you know um, what's it called kind of PG PG answer and then go back later and I'm like oh I should have been more assertive again or whatever whatever it is so but yeah So, um, in your view, um, how should a youngster of today balance out between short-term attractive career prospects and long-term strategic decisions or directions? Uh, often, what looks attractive in the short term may not be good from a long-term perspective. So, right. what is your views? Yeah, so I think now, like with a lot of the younger, the younger folks um, coming into the workforce, I feel like there's a lot of job hopping. They do do a lot of job hopping. Like they'll be at one place for six months and then they go somewhere else for a year. Um, and they're testing everything and trying everything out. And I feel like that's become kind of the norm. Um, so I think that's okay to test a lot of things and figure out what you like. And then at some point you gotta, you gotta pick something and, and think of that as a longer term career. Um, so that's kind of what I've seen and I think that's okay, right? Like, I feel like years ago, like it's like you have two jobs in your whole life and you're at your last job for 30 years and that was like the norm and the, the thing to do and now it's not so much that and i think it's okay like you know dabble in a lot of things like if you don't like your job move um and, and te test test the waters thank you ali um any other questions from the audience all right let me ask you then so um 
with this whole gender balanced workforce and organizations and there's a lot of focus on that uh, have you seen any positive impact of having a more gender balanced workforce uh, especially in the uh, cx or a bpo industry yeah um i don't know if i have personally but i had i did do some reading there was i think it was a forbes article that said women when women are more represented on the board or in a c suite um businesses have done better have bet had better performance um and i should try to dig maybe i can dig up that article because i was reading it yesterday um and share it with you guys um so i personally haven't seen like what those benefits are but there's a ton written about it um so i don't know if that answers your question it does it does so um i, I think uh, uh you know the the positive impact is uh, to do also with the kind of empathy uh, that women can bring in terms of decision making to the strategic thought process uh, for an organization and uh, we have seen that in the organization we have uh, in fact at moveit we have always had that constant endeavor to uh, focus on uh, the development of uh, women and uh, look at the leadership uh, women in leadership focus uh, interventions for them and that's uh, this, this whole series ali is is a part of that right in terms of yep. how we would like to get uh, inspiring leaders from the industry hear from you uh, and this can be inspirational for a lot of women who are there on the call today who also would want to grow in their careers so thank you so much ali for the time and if there is any last question uh, last thought that any of you would like to share with ali and just take a quick 30 seconds all right okay there is something on the chat so what would you suggest for a woman leader to manage another woman in the team in case one has family issues so um, our understanding could be much better so as a leader needs to manage the team as well as the role so how do you think and how do you think women can manage that um yeah i think it's all about being flexible um there's nothing worse when you have a family issue and like you feel like your job is like looking down upon you needing to leave early or So I think just being flexible and being supportive um is 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 key. I definitely had a job once where I was the only person on the team who had children. So it's like 5:00 o'clock, I'm out or you know, it's a Monday morning and I have to go to the pediatrician and they I felt like people were like looking down at me a little bit like, "Oh, I'm not in the office as much as others." Um so being a flexible manager and like empath- again, empathetic and like understanding is is huge. It's huge. Cause I've seen the other end of it and it does not feel good. <laughs> yeah. So so flexibility is is what you yeah, suggest. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you Ali. Uh may I now invite Kaila Starks who's our senior vice president customer success uh to propose a word of thanks and formally and officially thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much and and my apologies for not being able to attend right away. I actually had a a conflict with with Sunil uh in his meeting. So um this is actually my fourth day uh with Movate and I'm so excited to to be here. Um Ali, thank you so much for taking the time to to meet with us in your partnership. I've heard great things and looking forward to working with you as we move forward. Um as as a leader of account management, um y- y- you're absolutely right in that you have to be able to be empathetic to others, balance the work and the needs of of clients, employees, um and of course the 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 bottom line of of how we're doing as a business. And um I think as women we we are able to bring that to the table where we're used to to spinning multiple plates you know you mentioned um the the pediatrician and then the business meetings and and everything yep. else and, and don't forget you know there's there's dinner that needs to be served by 7 right. <laughs> and that doesn't necessarily stop um just because we we move through the ranks or or you know we we get promoted and we have to figure that out so If you were to ask me what um having women in the C suite or having women in the board of directors table it it is definitely how to create balance and and how to do it all um you know the the last thing that that I'll say is that this program um was a major contributing factor to my joining Movate so I'm very excited to to be a part of it very excited to to bring leaders like Ali in um and looking forward to to where we go so the the what I'll ask the group is if you think of some other questions or you think of of anything else that you'd like to ask Ali and Ali if you don't mind helping us in the future Absolutely, yeah. um 
that that'd be great i i definitely uh, definitely look forward to that so thank you again for for joining i hope that you're able to to join us in the future um i'd love it if eventually maybe next year we can create some live and in-person types of events where us as women can get together and, and network and and brainstorm so thank you again thank you guys this was so fun and like refreshing um so yeah looking to looking forward to working with you guys Absolutely. Right, thank, thank you so much, much Ali. Thank, thank you, you Kailan. So thank you everyone for this engaging session. Um, so good day, good evening, and until we see you in our next edition, signing off. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks, guys. See you.